And now it's time for the deep dive on cryptocurrencies I promised you a little while ago. Now, as I said previously, this video will be based on the writings from my own book from 2015, Utopian Capitalism, where I deal with a lot of utopian capitalist ideas like Bitcoin. So most of these writings will definitely be coming from there. So without further ado, let's get into it. Now, Bitcoin was created by a man named Satoshi, and one of his main reasons for doing so was to avoid third party entities when dealing with transactions online, because those financial institutions which facilitate the act of exchange incur fees. The capitalist does his work, so he expects to be paid for it. So one of the main ideas was to avoid these fees by creating something that could facilitate itself in order to avoid those financial institutions and their accompanying fees. And yes, no one likes paying those fees, but this is a capitalist providing a service, so you're going to have to pay up. Now Satoshi, the man who created Bitcoin, made this very clear when laying out his invention. Commerce on the internet has come to rely almost exclusively on financial institutions serving as trusted third parties to process electronic payments. While the system works well enough for most transactions, it still suffers from the inherent weakness of the trust-based model. Completely non-reversible transactions are not really possible since financial institutions cannot avoid mediating disputes. The cost of mediation increases transaction costs, limiting the minimal practical transaction size and cutting off the possibility for small casual transactions. There is a broader cost in the loss of ability to make non-reversible payments for non-reversible services. With the possibility of reversal, the need for trust spreads. Merchants must be wary of their customers, hassling them for more information than they would otherwise need. A certain percentage of fraud is accepted as unavoidable. These costs and payment uncertainties can be avoided in person by using physical currency, but no mechanism exists to make payments over a communications channel without a trusted party. What Satoshi is advocating here is the removal of financial institutions from the act of exchange. So what we're looking at with Bitcoin is not an alternative currency per se, but an alternative medium of exchange, which avoids many of the pitfalls that he perceives them to have. His complaints are the same that any industrial capitalist has. The transaction fees, interest on credit are too great and in their view, hinder the movement of money and capital which facilitate the movement of the economy. Financial institutions have played a dominating part in online transactions because they must be done electronically. So we can see what Satoshi's goal here. He wants to cut out the middleman who will demand his cut of the action. Another major purpose of using cryptocurrencies over regular digital fiat currencies is the ability to navigate around government institutions, or rather the record keeping that government makes mandatory of financial institutions. Now, this particular aspect of it is one that is held by the more ANCAP libertarian supporters of cryptocurrencies. And this, this is a very major selling point for them, the avoidance of any kind of governmental authority. Now, in this aspect, Satoshi really is a genius. What he has done here is create a medium of exchange that cannot be traced by the government at the point of transaction. It is still possible to track the purchases you make, but at the point of transaction using the blockchain technology, this renders it basically impossible. What the ANCAP libertarian minded really want is an ability to dodge the Federal Reserve or Central Bank. To them, the idea of an overall authority regarding a currency is simply abhorrent. Money must exist within a free system away from any central authority. That is the basis of their ideologies after all. Unfortunately for them, when we actually take a detailed look at how cryptocurrencies work and more specifically, how their use is facilitated, we still see quasi financial institutions and some kind of central authority overwatching the entire thing. And this very fact alone undermines the very basis for their decision to go with a cryptocurrency over fiat government issued currency. 
We define an electronic coin as a chain of digital signatures. Each owner transfers the coin to the next by digitally signing a hash of the previous transaction and the public key of the next owner and adding these to the end of the coin. A payee can identify the signatures to verify the chain of ownership. The problem, of course, is that the payee can't verify that one of the owners did not double spend the coin. A common solution is to introduce a trusted central authority, or mint, that checks every transaction for double spending. After each transaction, the coin must be returned to the mint to issue a new coin, and only coins issued directly from the mint are trusted not to be double spent. The problem with this solution is that the fate of the entire money system depends on the company running the mint, with every transaction having to go through them, just like a bank. We need a way for the payee to know that the previous owners did not sign any earlier transactions. For our purposes, the earliest transaction is the one that counts, so we don't care about latter attempts to double spend. The only way to confirm the absence of a transaction is to be aware of all transactions. In the Mint-based model, the Mint was aware of all transactions and decided which arrived first. To accomplish this without a trusted party, transactions must be publicly announced and we need a system for participants to agree on a single history of the order in which they were received. The payee needs proof at the time of each transaction. The majority of nodes agreed it was the first received. This very reality undermines the narrative that it is somehow free from some kind of central authority. It is still very much there. And in fact, it's even in a greater concentration than even the Federal Reserve is, which completely destroys the entire myth of freedom in this case. And even then, this authority is still not even as reliable as traditional financial institutions. It has already been proven by some hackers that one can completely double spend these coins, throwing the entire system into chaos. This was proven in June of 2006 when a single miner of bitcoins from a, 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 an entity known as Ghash managed to get 51% of all the computing power behind the creation of bitcoins. From it, they were able to wield a kind of market power that completely dominated the use of it and demonstrated extraordinary abilities to actually be able to control the currency and the transactions were, that were carried out. Now, eventually they were discovered by a team of researchers at Cornell University. With their monopoly power, it made it possible to spend the same coin twice and even block rival miners' transactions. Theoretically, they could even extort higher fees from people with large holdings. In the most extreme case, they could perform a denial of service attack against the entire Bitcoin network. Ars Technica did a powerful article on the whole incident. Ita Eel, a postdoctorate researcher at Cornell's Department of Computer Science. But having a single entity in Ghash's position of holding 51% of the mining power, of being in a monopoly position, of being able to launch any of these attacks at will, completely violates the spirit and intent of Bitcoin as a currency. Bitcoin's value proposition stems from its technological foundation, which is in turn based on building distributed trust. People flock to Bitcoin because they do not trust the fiat infrastructure. They hold Bitcoin because they are worried that people in charge of the US dollar can inflate it at will or usurp money from their accounts. But now, with monop a monopoly miner, they are in the same position where they have to, once again, trust a single entity to remain benign. This completely collapses the Bitcoin narrative that the Bitcoin community has been using to draw in new users. If we are to trust Gash's goodwill and ongoing benign behaviors, we might as well do away with the entire Bitcoin protocol and replace the system with a single database server kept on Gash's premises. Worse, no one knows who exactly is behind ghcex.io. They have had an episode where they did a double spending attack against a gambling site in the past. But even if Ghash could be trusted right now, a single entity in command of the currency represents a single point of failure for the Bitcoin economy. Now, on the basis of trying to avoid what it is that these people feel is wrong with fiat currency, the inherent greed of human beings, central regulation by some kind of entity and trust issues, we see Bitcoin completely fails in that regard. 
But more importantly, what they don't see is the fact that with their alternative currency, their medium of exchange, they, what they are trying to really avoid is the very nature of capitalism itself. Something that cannot be done by simply changing the, the medium of exchange that you use. Here we get to the main problem with Bitcoin as we would any other digital currency. It's inherently a valueless, non-physical digital object. It is not like gold or fiat currency where there is some kind of inherent value to it. This is what separates Bitcoin from other forms of currency and one of the things that keeps it from being able to function as a regular currency in the mainstream. This is why Bitcoin will never take over. This is why Bitcoin can never truly be an actual currency because it is devoid of this kind of value. What it really has is demand. There's a subjective belief that it has some kind of value, that mostly being the ideological biases of the individuals who purchase it. This is not value in itself. It's really only demand. And that's what the difference is here. Now, from here, we'd be expanding into the political economic basis for money and the system in which it exists. But that's not the point of this video. This, the point of this video is really only to discuss the difference between Bitcoin and regular currency and why, in the end, Bitcoin cannot actually fill the role of a currency. So that explanation is just a little bit beyond the scope of this video, but something that is covered in my book. Now, since there is a lack of inherent value in Bitcoin or any other digital currency, this ends up being the major issue. People have trust issues with it because there's nothing really guaranteeing the value of that money at all. Not in the same way it would with other currencies. The currency is unaccountable and has nothing to guarantee its value. This is why the US dollar and other government issued currencies have a determined value. Regulated currencies are not made subject to the sudden and reoccurring bouts of instability, at least not normally. Actually existing capitalism demands a stable currency for the ease and function of the markets and exchange. Parties don't want a currency that isn't backed by anything. People want a currency that is going to retain its value. That is why gold is a better means of payment and store value than Bitcoin is. Even though it's still subject to fluctuation, it is nowhere near as bad as Bitcoin is. Gold, however, does have a utility outside of it as a currency. It is used in the manufacturing of electronics and jewelry, etc. Now, the real demand for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies comes from two primary sources, which I'll discuss. These people are choosing it over cash because of their political and philosophical orientation. It's not an efficient or effective means of exchange, but it still does fill the moral demands of its users. The online community relatively likes it because of its ability to bypass financial institutions without having to pay fees to them. This drives its use there, not any supposed idea of value. The second reason it has a demand, and probably the more important one, is the fact that while it has no intrinsic value itself, what it can do is operate like a stock, something that you can purchase, hold on to, and sell at a later date for more money, exactly like a stock. Because the value of digital currency can fluctuate so greatly, and because people want it, it fits right in with investing in stocks. This is the very nature of the stock market itself. It's something that, it's, it's the value that people want, where its ownership can bet on it to increase in value over time. Again, here we see the phenomenon. It's not desired as a means of exchange as a currency. It's held for its secondary characteristic, its ability to vary greatly in value. So here we face the paradox of cryptocurrencies. If it cannot serve the purpose of as, as an adequate means of exchange, and it does, doesn't have any inherent value in it, then what's the point of having it? The answer is the ability to exchange it for fiat currency. With all these applications for it, there remains one aspect that makes the currency usable. That is the fact it can be converted into US dollars. Without this ability to be converted into actual currency, US dollars, 
Bitcoin would be absolutely worthless. You can't buy anything substantial with it. You can't engage in day-to-day -day economic activity with it. If you want to eat something, you have to use government-issued currency. Financial institutions who bet on it hold on to it only because it can increase in value. That value is measured in how many U.S. dollars it can be sold for, just like a regular stock. When ANCAPs or libertarians talk about how Bitcoin is deflationary, meaning it can only increase in value, that value is measured in its ability to be sold for U.S. dollars. If Bitcoin could not be converted in this way, no one would use it. Bitcoin exists only so long as government-issued money does. So, if it's really nothing more than a highly speculative stock, how does it differ from any other stock? Well, the difference is investing in Bitcoin is inherently unproductive. The mining of, of Bitcoin itself, buying them, holding onto them and selling them, doesn't actually accomplish anything. And this is very different than holding stocks in a company where the profitability of that company is something that goes into it. At least when you're investing into a, a company, you're doing something that's with regards to human labor that can generate value. Like, for example, with gold, at least if you have gold holdings in a gold company, they're producing a physical commodity that's producing some kind of value. That's not the deal with Bitcoin. And that's the difference between holding a regular stock and holding a Bitcoin. Bitcoin holding it is inherently unproductive. So Bitcoin is that that unproductive. It's not like other stocks which can increase in value because of the potential earnings in that company or that, you know, guessing this or that. It's unproductive, meaning it creates no other value. And that's what's tremendously unique about this. It doesn't add anything to the economy. Now, there's, as much as you can criticize capitalism and the, the arena of finance capital, finance capital does facilitate value creation to a degree as it provides the financing for the industrial capitalists. And that in itself, potential revenues in the future being paid back on a loan is what gives the stock its, its value. If the, the company is projected to do well, then the stock is going to go up. Whereas that is not the case with Bitcoin. It's purely and wholly nothing but speculation and a wholly unregulated speculation at that. When you purchase stock in oil or gas production, you're purchasing the power to produce something that is valuable. That ability to produce it is what makes these stocks have value. When you purchase Bitcoin with the intent of holding onto it until it increases in value is different. In doing this, you're only betting on whether or not someone will want the stock, the Bitcoin, for more money in the future. These are two totally different things. Possibly the most disgusting aspect of this is the environmental damage it does. Now, this was something, uh, an issue that was raised most famously by Elon Musk when he had sort of abandoned cryptocurrencies, but there's no means, you know, his discovery. The environmental damage has been put best by the Sierra Club when they wrote up a thing about it earlier this year, I believe in March, in which they, they really detailed some of the environmental impacts that are occurring as a result of its astronomical energy use. Bitcoin's annual energy consumption is comparable to some entire country, such as Argentina and Ukraine. Bitcoin produces 36.95 megatons of carbon dioxide annually, comparable to New Zealand. And it's estimated that in 30 years, Bitcoin alone could increase the global temperature two degrees Celsius. About 65% of cryptocurrency mining occurs in China, where electricity is cheaper. Other countries with major mining operations include the United States, Russia, and Kazakhstan. But as an important final word on Bitcoin and digital currencies themselves, it's to point out that this, this currency, this type of currency, doesn't actually fundamentally alter the way in which currencies work. Because the currencies work dependent upon the system in which it exists. Bitcoin does not, any currency, does not exist ahistorically devoid of some kind of historical, political, economic context. That would be nothing short of absolute nonsense. It is made subject to the laws of the system in which it existed. Theoretically, if Bitcoin had existed in feudalism, it would have functioned completely different than it does 
under capitalism. This is, of course, stretching it a bit and creating a fictitious situation, but you do understand the point that I'm trying to make here. Were there huge, complex financial instruments in primitive accumulation or in feudal society? No, because there was no requirement for them. It was not a part of their currency. Today we see that the prevailing mode of capitalist production requires all these complex schemes to achieve the goals they were intended for. Fractional reserve banking systems, derivatives, collateralized debt obligations, all these phenomena require money to act in a certain way that was not previously required of it. Money reacts and its function is shaped by the demands placed upon it by society. Bitcoin is not immune to this reality of money. What this really shows us in the end is that Bitcoin is no challenge to the system. Bitcoin is not something that can rival actual government issued fiat currency. And there's a reason for that. Because that currency has to act that way for a reason. What Bitcoin cannot do is fulfill the needs of a capitalist economy. It can't do everything that is required of it. That's why government issued fiat currency acts the way it does out of necessity, not some kind of huge scheme to rob people out of money or some kind of conspiratorial nonsense. Capitalism is a system, a system like many others, which makes certain demands on the things that exist within it in order for that system to function. Bitcoin cannot fulfill those functions. And because it cannot do that, it cannot overtake fiat currency or even gold for that matter, because it cannot facilitate the needs of that system. And that is the inherent flaw within it and why Bitcoin will never be anything more than a valueless asset traded by tech geeks. Now, of course, there's much more to all of this, but I have no desire to give away the entire content of my book, and particularly the section of it with regards to Bitcoin. So you'll have to get the book in order to get the rest of it. Plus, I don't want this video to be end up being too long so that people end up not watching at all. So that's my deep dive on cryptocurrencies just some important context that people need because it has becoming more popular again. And on top of that, thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. If you like this program, then please head over to my Patreon page and set up a monthly donation. It's your donations that keep this program running. Also, if you would like, please rate, comment, subscribe, and share in various social media.